pain relief, uh, pain relief practices. Now some of these are going to sound very trite, um, simple. Uh, do not um, judge them until you've tried them. Some of the most simple ones have proven to be some of the most powerful ones uh, f for my clients. And I never know how to tell which one's going to be which. So um, the first one is language changes. Just merely the language that you use to talk to yourself and other people about your experience. What we've learned is that your mind-body system pays attention to every word you say. If you say, boy, that person is a real pain in the neck. Well, oh, okay, we could do that. You know? <laughs> you're teaching your mind-body system how to respond to what you're saying or what you're thinking. Uh, uh, this person drives me crazy. Well, be careful with that one because <laughs> they really can <laughs> if you <laughs> allow them that sort of uh, opportunity. So if you uh, stop calling it pain and calling it something else, discomfort is one that a lot of my clients have chosen. I don't have pain anymore, I have this discomfort. Can you see how pain is up here and discomfort's down here? Right away you're teaching yourself to lower that sensitivity uh, in your response to it. Disassociation. This is a process where most of us, when we think of ourselves, we say, I'm right here, I'm in my body. But what if you, what if I decided, well, part of me is going to go over and sit in that chair and look back at me, I would be disassociated. You can do a double disassociation. You can imagine that you're in a movie theater watching yourself on the screen. Now you're out of your body, you're just watching yourself. Now imagine that you're up in the projection booth watching yourself in the theater, watching yourself on the screen. Now you're double dissociated. Each one of those reduces emotional impact and also experience of suffering. So just getting out of your body. I have a lot of clients that go into operations and I say, just, just Pretend like you say, okay, while they're operating on my body, I'm just going to be standing over in the corner and let them go ahead and do what they need to do. And when they're through, then I'll move back in again. And you want to be sure to move back in again. That's very important <laughs> that you don't stay out. Um, there are, in fact, um, psychological conditions where people move out and don't move back in again, and they, they remain disassociated. That's not a danger. That is a serious uh, problem. but. Uh, practice, you can do it and come back in. Recalling a past experience, number three. If you start thinking about a time before you had this experience of suffering, your mind-body system will adjust itself to that period of time and immediately the current situation begins to, to drop down. And so you can use uh, the path. Or you can anticipate a future situation that's going to be really fun and absent of any discomfort, and your body will immediately respond to that also. The fourth one is a jamming dialogue. Um, if you say a phrase, and this one that I've got in here now is totally numb now, totally numb now, totally numb now, and um, you just say it over and over and over again. One of the things we've learned is that your conscious mind can only deal with one thing at a time. It's a single-threaded process. Unconscious mind, can we don't even know how many things it can do simultaneously. It's a multiprocessor. So it's running all these body systems uh, in the background at the same time. Conscious mind, one thing. So if you're saying, oh, that hurts so bad, that hurts so bad, that hurts so bad, just ch change it to, I'm totally numb now, totally numb now, totally numb now. And it has a jamming effect that will cause relief. Submodality work. Um, every, every sense that we have, we call it a modality. Um, seeing, uh, feeling, tasting, smelling, hearing, all modalities, and each one of those has submodalities to it. What we found is that the way you represent pain to yourself operates at the submodality level. If you change those submodalities, 
your mind-body system does not know how to process it the same way it used to. So if you, um, let's, uh, let's see what I've got in here, uh, visual modality. Change the image if you said, well, what is my, if I could see this pain, what would it look like? And I had an interesting client, he, said he had a knee replacement and he came out and he couldn't go to sleep uh, the first night. So he said, I need to work on, on that. And so I said, well, if you could imagine this pain, where is it? And he said, uh, it's, it's under the back of my knee and it's a, a tiny little hard red ball and it's pulsating and it's hot and it's pulsating. That's what, it, that's what it would look like if I could see it. I said, okay, what I want you to do is move it up onto the top of your knee and I want you to convert it into a very, very soft, squishy, light blue box that's cool, very cool. So I've changed all the submodalities he told me about, I changed them to something else. And I said, just practice that as you're going to sleep tonight, and I'll check with you in the morning. So I came back in the morning. I said, how did it work? And he said, oh, it didn't work at all. It was terrible. He said, I, I was sitting here saying, little squishy blue box on top of my knee, and it's cool. Little squishy blue, you know, he's going. And he said, and then I woke up <laughs> the next morning. <laughs> I said, well, that sounds like it worked pretty good then, didn't it? And he said, Oh, yeah, I guess it did. <laughs> so, so sometimes you don't even realize that these things are happening and, uh, and they're going on. That, uh, it's, it was really amazing to him. He, he, was, he was funny about, about that. Um, there, are, there are visual submodalities. Uh, there are auditory. If it was making a sound, change the sound. Um, if, it, um, if it had a taste or a smell, uh, you, know, you, can, you can change that too. Uh, so, uh, just play with that because what we found is that when you change the submodalities, your body is used to processing as pain and suffering. It gets confused. It, it's what is this? I don't know what to do with it, you know. And then you can start choosing something like discomfort, and um, and and kind of substitute that. Number six is ownership. People talk about, oh, my back is just sore. Instead of my back, how about that back or uh, somebody's back, you can even get real ambiguous, say somebody's back is really sore, <laughs> you know, it's not mine, but somebody's. Um, you can uh, say my discomfort or that discomfort, uh, that minor discomfort, you can even put adjectives with it too and, and start scaling it down. So you have control of the language you use about the way you describe your sense to yourself of how you feel, and you can start manipulating that. Number seven, one of the most creative ones I've ever seen, is called um, reduction by location having. So someone comes in and says, I just have a horrible headache. I say, really, is it on the left side of your head or the right side? And you go, oh, it's on the right side of my head. Okay, is it the uh, 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 upper part of your head or the lower part? Oh, it's the upper part. You know, is it more toward the front or more toward the back? Oh, it's more toward the front. Well, we've now halved it and halved it and halved it, and now it's, and so then what you want to do is do the same thing to that little piece. Well, is it in the left side of the right side or the right side of the right side? You know, is it in the top of the top or the bottom of the top? Is it in the front of the front or the back of the front? And you keep getting it down, and w what happens with a lot of clients is it gets so small they can't find it anymore. And, and surprising to them, they also don't have the discomfort anymore. So it's just that you just keep chopping it in half. And sometimes you can, you can retain where it is, but it's, it's in such a tiny space that it just is not as, uh, as uncomfortable as it was before. Um, starting at the bottom, some mindful meditation um, practices, progressive relaxation and deep breathing. Um, very, very powerful things that you can do. Progressive relaxation is when you say, my toes are relaxing, my feet are relaxing, my heels relaxing, my ankles relaxing. My wife does this and she's never gotten past her knee, I don't believe, before she's <laughs> gone. And so you, you just very gradually naming each part of your body, you just relax yourself all the way. And most people, if you have trouble sleeping, uh, this has been tremendously powerful. Usually you don't, you don't get all the way. Now, with hypnosis, just to give you a little clue, I use that in the induction phase of the hypnosis. 
And after we get all the way up to the top of their head, I do the hypnosis um, uh, session that we're going to do and say, now let's go back and what we want to do is take that relaxation and have it collect all the stuff that doesn't belong in your mind-body system anymore. Uh, any, any discomfort, any pain, any suffering, any negative beliefs, any negative attitudes, uh, uh, any negative thoughts that you have, just get sucked into this kind of a cloud and we're going to have this cloud just move right back down your body through your head, shoulders, chest, back, stomach and hips and go on down to the knees and then out through your toes, boom, like that. And it's like a mind-body system cleanse, you could call it, that just pulls all the junk out. And we store junk all the time that doesn't belong in our system and we just hold it, you know, so that's a way to, to get rid of it. Mind-body dialogue, this is one of the things that uh, was, was amazing to me. Uh, I had clients start saying, if my immune system in my body knows how to heal itself, why did I have to come to you to get it to do that? And I said, I don't know. Next time when you're in a nice deep hypnotic trance state, I will ask you and your unconscious mind, if it wants to, will tell me why that happened. Started getting back a very consistent answer. And the answer was, because you didn't ask me. I thought, wow, boy, if the doctors find out about this, we're going to really have some powerful <laughs> healing going on. The, most doctors don't ask you to, you know, would you mind getting well for me now? <laughs> you know, and, and, w and when you wear that white coat, and you know, it has a huge impact. That's an authority figure that we're trained to accept their, um, you know, their instructions as being pretty potent things. Uh, number three is the uh, sacred place. And um, what I find is that most of my clients do not have a retreat that they can access instantaneously anytime. And this is an imaginary place and you put into it everything that you love, everything you like to look at, to hear, to feel, to smell, to taste, whatever. You create it, you give it a name, it's a secret name that you're the only one who knows that name and that's a post-hypnotic suggestion for you to go back there when you want to. You just say that name. You close your eyes, take a few deep breaths, and imagine you're back at that place. A lot of my clients go there as they're going into surgery. Before they get the anesthetic, they go to their, their sacred, I call it the secret place, favorite place. Some people call it their happy place. It's very sacred, and it's a way to retreat from all the hustle and bustle around you. You just go into that place and you can recharge and recenter and rejuvenate yourself uh, when you're there. Very powerful. Uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, uh, one of my current uh, guru uh, thought leaders, a cellular uh, research biologist, uh, has written a book uh, called The Biology of Belief and it's one of the most potent uh, books that I've ever seen on the power of the mind uh, to influence the body. And he says, basically, Watson and Crick had it wrong. We're not a victim of our DNA. Watson and Crick said it goes uh, DNA, RNA, protein. And here comes Bruce Lipton and says, it can also go protein, RNA, DNA. Well, that turned the whole biological world upside down and really created an uproar. Uh, and as a result, he resigned a tenured profess uh, uh, position at Stanford University because he couldn't get people to stop teaching something that he could demonstrate in the lab, and they could too, that was incorrect. So he said, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to go out on my own. So what he found out was that if you take a um, cell and put it in a very uh, positive, supportive environment in a Petri dish, it turns on, and in other words, it expresses certain genes in a certain way, uh, and it moves into growth, learning, creativity. You can take that cell, put it into a very a uh, poisonous medium in a petri dish. It's like a switch in the cell flips over to survival and all that other stuff is shut down and now it's just strictly can I can I survive? You know, can I can I live? And 
everything's degraded to the minimum basic level. Take that same cell out, put it back in the positive medium, the switch goes over, he said, almost instantaneously and the cell shifts. It, it, sh it, it is expressing uh, genes in a different way. So he says, so if we think about the medium that a cell lives in, and, and we're, we're concerned about the cells in our body, what's the medium they live in? Well, they're surrounded by blood. Blood is the medium of the, of the uh, cell in our body. And he said, w how would we do something with our mind to create a better medium uh, for these cells to live in? And basically what they're coming down to, it is gratitude and appreciation. So if you will wake up in the morning and think of three or four things that you have to be thankful for, to be grateful for, and just before you go to sleep at night, think of three or four more things that you have to be thankful and grateful for. Fabulous way to change the medium that your cells live in, and it literally turns on and turns off the genetic expression of your genes, and you are literally living in a different environment. And it's one of the most healthy ones that we, uh, that we can, can create. Number five is called affirmations. That's not a misprint. We, we know about affirmations, where we affirm something. We say, I'm not going to feel any more pain, you know. And your critical factors out there saying, yeah, 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 I hear, you know, yeah, big chance of that. An affirmation is a question. What this particular researcher found is if you make an affirmation that doesn't match reality, your critical factor will attack it right away and say, not true. That, that can't be. An affirmation triggers a whole different set of responses because we're all problem-solving creatures. We're hardwired to problem-solve. An affirmation is a question. How is it that I no longer feel as much pain and I don't suffer as much as I used to? That's an affirmation. Your body, mind-body system, will immediately start working to try to figure out how can that be? And it'll always come up with an answer. And that answer is going to be something that reduces your level of, of pain and, and, and your level of suffering. So it's, a, it's asking a question. The mind-body wash I already talked about. As you do the progressive relaxation, imagine that it's a liquid or a cloud or whatever you might want to use as your uh, imagery and let it wash up. Collect all the junk in your body and then wash right back down out of your, out of your toes and it's gone. Seven is something I developed um, more recently and still, uh, still working with that to uh, determine um, maybe how effective it is. Imagine that the Queen of England were to have her staff notify some little town in, in, uh, in England that she was going to be coming to spend the day there in about three months. Imagine what would happen in that town. Um, my understanding is that they would start painting the trees and the sidewalks and every. I mean, it would be the cleanest and the spiffiest as they know how to make it. And, and the, the queen would not go to do anything, to fix anything, to repair anything. She goes to give her royal presence to that spot. And she might, you know, do the, the royal wave a little bit. That would be okay. She could smile and nod a little bit like that. But that's it. No speeches, no, no, no policy announcements or anything like that. The town explodes with this excitement and this feeling of honor that the queen is coming to our place. So the mindful meditation of the queen or the emperor, if you're a guy, is that you announce to the part of your body that you perceive as where the source of your discomfort is, that you're going to be visiting there, and you're going to be spending 15 minutes there every day. And you do that. All you do is just close your eyes and imagine going to your knee or your hip or your lung or whatever it might be, and just Imagine what it would be like to just be there 
and allow that part of your body to respond to your presence. Amazing what's happened with some of the clients that have been using this. And they say, how can that, well, I didn't do anything. I said, oh, yes, you did. You went there. And that is, that is a huge honor to that part of your body. There's also a mantra that you can use. That is a sound, usually meaningless, uh, but it can be something like peace or ocean or love or something. And it's a jamming technique, sort of a, a variation on the jamming technique, where you just say that over and over and over again. And it doesn't allow anything else into your conscious mind. It, it essentially blocks that. Now, there are other things beyond these, and um, uh, there's uh, uh, emotional freedom tapping, EFT, one of the most powerful things that, that you can, uh, can do if there's an emotional component to your pain. And we have an upcoming expert, uh, and Dr. Dr. Bob is with us, going to specialize in, in EFT. And, and so I just want you to get a flavor for there are just lots of things that you can engage in that will allow you to become engaged in your own health. It's like our, our poor immune systems, evolutionary bodies, working as hard as they can, and uh, we've thrown insecticides and pesticides and herbicides and hormones and antibiotics and um, uh, cell phone towers and re microwave relays and all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm sure in three or four million years, they'll figure out how to get through all that with health, but you know that'll be a little too late for us. So, so what you can do by getting engaged in your own health is kind of give it a 2013.1 update to your whole immune system. And uh, a word that I just learned that's very fascinating to me is called upregulating your immune system. You, your immune system works you know, at some level, best it knows how, and you can temporarily upregulate it to get through a crisis and then it goes back to its normal state. Discovered that the immune system can be depressed with stress and overwork and lack of sleep, things like that. Well, that means it's an open system. It's open to influence. So that means you can also boost it up and, and give it a little supercharge to help you get through a crisis that you may have. 